And welcome to worship on this new day. Aren't we thankful for each new day as a gift from God with its possibilities, with its opportunities? We don't know what the next hour is going to bring, what the next day is going to bring, but God is with us. And for that, we're thankful. So let's just have a moment of quiet and stillness in his presence as we prepare for worship. Heavenly Father, you are here in this place and we thank you. You were awake before the sun rose. Before this day came, you knew what was going to happen. So we come into your presence and we trust you. We give the day back to you in worship and ask that you will speak to us and use us to do something beautiful and amazing for Jesus' sake today. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our opening song and it's song number 27 in the Blue Salvation Army songbook. So if you're using the songbook, it's song number 27, but we should have the words, hopefully. Coming up on the screen, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me in thy powerful hand, bread of heaven. Feed me now and evermore. You know, I'm so glad I chose this song because the number of Welsh people in the congregation has doubled this morning. They have doubled in population, and so this is a good opening song. So if you're able to stand, stand, and we'll sing and we'll raise our voices together in praise today. to worship this morning and uh, I chose that song deliberately because it says doesn't it pilgrim through this barren land now we are about to enter the Salvation Army season of self-denial and we are also about to enter the Christian season of Lent which is normally associated with with the desert. 
with Jesus fasting in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. There are times when we enter the desert, sometimes willingly and sometimes unwillingly. But the Lord is with us on the journey through the barren land. And in this season, the character of Christ is formed in us. So let's pray together. Lord, as we journey through the desert, willingly or unwillingly, we know that you are with us. In the seasons when we don't have very much and we feel dry and hungry and desperate, we remember that you've already walked this path. We pray that you will lead us through the desert, that streams of water will spring up there to sustain us. And we trust you that at the end of this particular journey, you will have done something amazing in our lives. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing another song again, a song of praise. All my days, I will sing this song of worship. If you're using the songbook, it's 238. And it also reminds us that Jesus is with us through the difficulties that life brings. He is always with us. So we're going to raise our soft voices in praise and in prayer this morning. Michael, can you do it?
great song. Isn't that a great song of praise? I long to be where the praise is never ending. And I don't know if you noticed, but that song is packed through with the names of the Lord. In the Bible, there's lots of different names that Jesus is known by. One of my favorites is Star of the Morning, because I had a time in my life when I couldn't sleep at night. And you can't phone anyone at 2.30 in the morning, can you? But the star of the morning was awake and he could hear my prayers. And maybe a bit later on, I'll get you to share if you've got a favourite name of the Lord or a favourite name of Jesus that encourages you and we can share them together. But we'll do that a bit later on when we've had a chance to think about it. Just now... We're going to watch a video that is introducing, in, uh, introducing this year's self-denial appeal, where we support other believers, other Christians, the Salvation Army all around the world. And uh, it's a time when we focus and are encouraged by what is God is doing in different places. So let's watch this now. Hello, my name is Catherine Wiles. Welcome to the first of our films for this year's Self-Denial Appeal. This year we'll be focusing on Salvation Army officership. We'll be meeting Salvation Army officers in three different parts of the world finding out a bit about what they do and asking them why they do it. But first, let's look at last year's appeal. Last year we focused on children and young people. We met Josh Frieda, a student in a Salvation Army school in Kenya. We saw how the Salvation Army in Moldova is supporting Dimitri, a 14-year-old refugee who fled from Ukraine with his granddad. And we met Joyce from Pakistan, who's hoping one day to be a doctor. Thank you so much for the money you gave. Thanks to you, we raised more than a million pounds last year. You gave generously and sacrificially, and your self-denial money is already making a real difference. Many of you watching this will know all about self-denial. Many of you have been giving faithfully for years, but there may be people watching who are new to the Salvation Army and who are less familiar with the Self-Denial Appeal. So here's a reminder of what it's all about. Self-Denial is an appeal to raise money for the Salvation Army's work around the world. William Booth introduced the idea over 130 years ago. It happens every year, and most Salvation Army Corps around the world take part. Being part of the Salvation Army makes us part of a global movement. Self-denial gives us a chance to pause for a moment and to think about the work that the Salvation Army is doing in other parts of the world. Self-denial is also a prompt to learn more about the Salvation Army and to support our sisters and brothers in prayer. And it's about giving money. Self-denial offers us all a challenge, to go without something and give the money we've saved. Some people who are able give a week's salary, one week's salary on missionary service. Some of the money we give goes to our mission partners. They are Denmark and Greenland, Finland and Estonia, Ghana including Togo, Pakistan and South America East. All the rest goes to international headquarters in London. They send it to places that need it most and it supports the mission of the Salvation Army around the world. It pays for the essential things that most of us don't think about, things like admin and church infrastructure things you might not notice until they're not there. That means Salvation Army officers, staff and volunteers can get on with the vital work they are doing. Hi Alistair! 
This is Rutherglencore, just outside of Glasgow, and it's where I work as a Salvation Army officer. This morning, we've been having our over 60s lunch. Making connections with the local community is a big part of my work here. There's a long history of Salvation Army officers doing this kind of work. From the first officers trained in East London in the 1870s and 80s to the first international pioneers of the Salvation Army's work overseas. Today, the Salvation Army is at work in 134 countries. Salvation Army officership is our focus for this year as we think about the international work of the Salvation Army. For the next few weeks, we'll hear from Salvation Army officers in three very different parts of the world. In Mizoram, a state in eastern India, we'll meet Captains Anthony and Markimi. They run an adult rehabilitation centre for people who are struggling with addictions to drugs and alcohol. The centre supports 20 men on their journey to recovery. In Nuuk, in Greenland, we'll meet Captain Nathaniel, who runs the Salvation Army Corps and a social cafe with his wife, Rukana. The cafe is supporting people from the homeless community in the city. The average temperature during the winter months is minus five degrees Celsius, so food and warmth provided by the Salvation Army is a godsend. In Salto, in Uruguay, We'll meet Lieutenants Jose and Kayla, who run both Salvation Army Corps in the city. They host a food distribution program for people who are struggling, and they're also making connections with young people who live in the neighborhood. There are quite a few ways to give to self-denial. You can use the envelope or this year's collection box. There's a QR code that links through to salvationist.org.uk. Or if you have a standing order set up already, you can make a payment that way. Next week, we'll be going to Greenland. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Now, I've had this whole desert thing in my head. And um, as you do, I thought, you can't talk about the desert without involving an inflatable cactus. So I've got one here. As you can see, it's on the wonk. <laughs> Doesn't look as healthy as that one there. No. Okay. I thought we ought to have... Who put that up? <laughs> that is not the image of a cactus that I was hoping for. Right, this is what more what I was hoping for, okay? Now, this is a very special kind of cactus, okay, called the... I don't know how you say that, Sugaro, okay? It only grows in the Sonoran Desert, okay? These ones with the arms, okay? These things are amazing. They can live up to 200 years, and they can grow up to 60 foot in the desert. So there is life in the desert. <laughs> Life is possible. They grow incredibly slowly. They only gain one to one and a half inches in the first eight years of their life. And it's not until they're 35 years old that they produce any flowers. It takes nearly 100 years for the seguro to grow its first arm. So you can tell how old it is by the number of arms it has. This one doesn't look it, but it's 300 years old. It's the sort of six old. No. <laughs> and it's not standing up at the moment. 
Oh, dear. Anyway, the more arms, the older the cactus is. But when you go close to these things, you notice actually that often they've got lots of little holes bored in them from the insects and the birds who need them for food and for refreshment. Sometimes the base of the cactus has been eaten by jackrabbits. Sometimes in the desert there are wild fires that come and you will see that the, the, the cactus can often show damage, smoke damage or charring. They are also prone to get sunburn and frostbite. So what's amazing is when they've had all these things that are attacking them, how are they still standing in the desert? Well, actually, these cactuses are incredibly strong. Inside the cactus are these long bones of wood that give it its strength. And what is really strange about these bones is they're not heavy, they're not dense, they're actually lightweight and soft. So these cactuses are a good illustration of the life of a Christian. Because life does come at us, doesn't it? We get burned we get things that are nibbling at us and decaying us. We go through wildfires and difficult times. We grow in thin soil. But we are strong because of what is inside us. And that is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit makes us both strong but also soft so that we can respond with compassion to others. I know it sounds a bit degrading, but we're a bit like the Andrex toilet roll, soft and strong. Soft and strong because of what is inside us. It says in scripture, doesn't it? We are hard pressed but on every side, but not destroyed because we have this treasure within. But there is something else that we need to take from these cactuses as we think about desert life. They have extremely long roots that go deep down to find the water and the sustenance that they need. And as a Christian, you need to make sure that your connection with the Lord goes deep. That it is not a shallow thing so that when the sun beats down on you and when the wind comes and when the problems come, your faith is deep and not shallow. You spend time in God's word. You spend time in prayer. Getting the sustenance that you need. So that when life hits you full force, you're still standing somehow. Because God is within us. Now, I just want to read a verse to you from Scripture, thinking about the desert, okay? I want to share with you the story of Hagar. Do you remember Hagar? Do you remember Hagar? She was the other woman. God bless her. The other woman. And uh, when Sarah and Abraham couldn't have children, they decided through the custom of taking another wife, that they would provide children for themselves through Hagar. And then it all goes horribly wrong and Sarah, Sarah is cruel to Hagar and she has to run away into the desert. But in the desert she meets with the Lord and the Lord tells her that he is with her and with the son that she will have and that he will bless her. So she gives this name to the Lord, one of the earliest names of the Lord in the Bible, 
You are the God who sees me. And if you're going through tough times, remember that. He is the God who sees us and knows what is going on. So I just want to give you an opportunity now to share, if you want to, some favourite names of the Lord that you may have. I know I'm putting you on the spot. And then we're going to say, I'm going to say a desert prayer. We're going to pray a desert prayer together. Okay. Anybody got a favourite name of the Lord? You're all feeling a bit shy, I know. It's difficult to think. Doreen's got one, that's good. I usually call him uh, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Peace. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great one, isn't it? Eno's got one. Eno! Oh, so good to see you. (laughs) Praise the Lord. (laughs) Sorry, I can't even stand now. I'm so tired. (laughs) Yeah. My calling, my provider. Yeah. The Lord, my provider. The Lord, our provider. I can't remember all the Hebrew terms exactly. El Shaddai, is it? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Sorry, the people who watch later can't hear you if you don't speak into a mic. (laughs) I think the Lord Almighty is El Shaddai, isn't he? El Shaddai, yeah. He's the brother. Oh, Jesus, our brother, yes. Yes, we, we, we talk sometimes about Jesus being the older brother, don't we? I had two older brothers... And they weren't always as kind as Jesus was. <laughs> so it's nice to have Jesus as an older brother. The father. The father. Yes. The omega. The omega. Alpha and omega. Yes. Beginning and the end. Last chance to share. Anybody got a name of the Lord? That means a lot. My saviour. My saviour. They're saying at the back. Well done. Sorry? Elohim. 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 Do you know do you know the translation of that? No. <laughs> we'll have to look it you, up. You are right. I just can't think of what the translation I, yes, is. My Elohim. mind has gone blank. The eternal. The yes. the the, uh, the learned officers on this side <laughs> believe it's the eternal. Yes, we will find out. But that's great, isn't it? The names of the Lord. And sometimes a particular name of the Lord is what you need at a particular season in your life. So we're just going to close our eyes now. We're going to pray as we enter the desert together. Let's pray this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that wherever I am, you are with me, guiding, protecting, providing. You make the mountains into a level path. You make streams flow in the desert. You cause roots to grow out of dry ground. So we say, thank you, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to see you at work when all hope seems lost. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, we do have some self-denial prayer points coming up as well. These are the things that they have asked us to pray about. James, have you got this? Uh, These are the prayer points for this week. So 
sorry. I've, I've got myself in a terrible muddle. You'll have to forgive me. Michael, can you come and help me with this? Okay. So it says, Lord, at the start of self-denial, the self-denial appeal, we ask you to show us something afresh in these weeks. Help us have a deeper understanding of your will and your work around the world. And you say? We thank you for giving us the financial ability to show our support and commitment to the Salvation Army's projects. May the money we raise benefit and provide new opportunities to grow your church. And you say, Internationally, people have listened and responded to your call and undertaken the responsibility of being Salvation Army leaders. Continue to bless their work and the impact they have in their local areas. Amen. Amen. Sorry, he sat down again, but actually he's oh, got to yeah. come and read the Bible to <laughs> us. Sorry, it's all going wrong. It's the practice. <laughs> so we're going to share in our scripture reading this morning, and we're going to go from Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, And we're going to read verses 5 through to 16. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through to 16. This is what they say. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter the towns of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their home until you leave. As you enter the home, give your blessing to it. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will welcome you or listen to your words, leave that, sorry, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more terrible for Sodom, for, for them then for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Now, just before we go on, I want us to do something because you all look quite subdued today. I want you to get up out of your seat, if you can, and find somebody and welcome them and say it's good to see them, and uh, just spend a few minutes welcoming people, okay? Loosen up a bit.
I don't know whose phone that is. Sorry. Yes, we'll, we'll tell you, um, we'll give you a warning about that a bit later. There's problems with that toilet. Mm. Anyway, now that you've all sat down, I'm going to ask you to stand up again. Sorry about that, because we're going to give to the Lord in the offering this morning, and then Hydron is going to pray God's blessing over it. So we do have a nice video, one that we've used before, that always puts a smile on my face. So we're going to enjoy this together the video is turn it around which we used last year a little bit i know my god will turn it around i have seen my god turn it around there are so many 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 times in my life that i have seen my god turn it around
eyes that I have seen my God turn it around. Thank you, Jesus, because you are turning the world around. You're turning our ways towards the good way. Thank you that you are willing to be in the driver's seat and that we can rely on you to guide us safely. And because you know the best, you are in charge, so we bring the money we put together to you, asking you that you use it that your kingdom grows, that people will receive help, spiritually and materially, and that your name will be glorified through everything we do and say. Praise be to you. Amen. Wasn't that song, isn't that song a great testimony song, isn't it? We've seen God turn it around. You know, it becomes easier for God to turn things around when we work with God, doesn't it? Often we can work against Him. Often we can find ourselves trying to do it on our own or think we know better. But when we learn to depend on Him, He turns it around time and time again. And when He does, we grow in faith we grow in our effectiveness as Christians. Let's just take a moment just to pray before we look closer at the Bible reading this morning. Father God, we just come before you and we thank you that you are willing to turn our lives around, that you, you love us so much, that, that you want something better for us, and that when we're faced with difficult situations, when we're faced with loss and hardship and pain, you can turn those things around into things of beauty, displaying your love, displaying your glory, and bringing us peace and joy. Please just be with us as we look at your word. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to start this morning. I'm going to do the Bible reading over again, but I'm going to read a different Bible translation, okay? Because sometimes it's helpful to look at different translations just to um, hear the different ways that it's expressed. So this translation is the message translation. So it's a little bit more contemporary language, language we might be more used to using in the everyday. This is what it says. It says, Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far-off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead, touch the untouchable, kick out the demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. <coughs> Don't think you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. And all you need to keep that going is three meals a day. Travel light. When you enter a town or village, don't insist on staying in the luxury inn. Get a modest place with some modest people. And you will be content there until you leave. When you knock on the door, be courteous in your greeting. If they welcome you, be gentle in your conversation. If they don't welcome you, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. You can be sure that on judgment day, they'll be mighty sorry. But it's no concern of yours now. Stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning you. You're going to be like sheep 
running through the wolf pack. So don't call attention to yourself. Be as shrewd as a snake and inoffensive as a dove. This year, we're, we're heading into our self-denial time. And this year, the Bible verse which has been chosen for our self-denial is found in those verses. That translation says, you've been treated generously, so live generously. Other translations say, freely you have received, so freely give. I wonder, what does that look like in everyday life? What does it look like not just to freely receive, but also to freely give? I wonder, have you ever heard of a chap named George Muller? Some of you might have. Some of you might not have. Yes? Um, oddly enough, I've known about this guy for ages. One thing I didn't know about him was that he is German. I didn't know he was German. I should have known by his name, to be quite honest, and the way it's spelt, that he wasn't from the UK. Um, but he, he was German. He's German-born. Uh, he was a little bit of a naughty boy uh, when he was younger. Um, in fact, he, his, his father signs him up to go to theological college, not because he was called to it, but because it would be a good career move. Um, and while he was there, he forged documents uh, to go on a trip to Switzerland with him and his mates. Um, and fortunately, he, in one sense, fortunately, he did that because while he was in Switzerland, he went to a Bible study and he got saved. He got truly saved. And his father, who sent him to theological college for a good career as a clergyman, became very disappointed when George Muller decided he wanted to be a missionary. Now, any of you that know anything about George Muller, you probably know two things about him. One, he was a huge proponent of prayer. And two, he was a huge proponent of relying on the provision of God. So, for those of you who don't know George Muller, all you got to do is visit Bristol. There's all sorts of children's homes that were opened because of him. He had a real heart. He lent, even though he wanted to be a missionary, in one sense, he did missionary work here in the UK. He came to the UK and, and settled in the Southwest, and he did all sorts of things running churches, but mostly providing homes for children who had been orphaned. And um, he did this. He was determined to do this purely through dependence on God. And part of that was praying for everything he needed, but not asking a single soul for anything. There's a story that's recounted by a young girl who lived in one of these homes. She says, early one morning, Abigail was playing in Mueller's garden on Ashley Down. When he took her by the hand, come, see what the father will do. He led her into the long dining room. The plates and cups and bowls were on the table. There was nothing on the table but empty dishes. There was no food in the larder and no money to supply the need. The children were standing waiting for breakfast. Children, you know we mustn't be late for school, said Mueller. Then lifting his hands, he prayed. Dear Father, we thank you for what thou art going to give us to eat. According to the account, a knock was heard at the door. The baker stood there. Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast. And the Lord wanted me to send you some. So I got up at two in the morning and baked some fresh bread and have brought it to you. Mueller thanked the baker and praised God for his care. Children, he said, we not only have bread, but a rare treat of fresh bread. Almost immediately, there came a second knock at the door. This time, it was the milkman. 
who announced that his milk cart had broken down outside the orphanage and he would like to give the children the cans of fresh milk so that he, it would be emptied so that his cart could be repaired. If you ask me what freely receiving and freely giving means, we just saw it there. Everything he received, he gave back out to others, to the children, to provide for their needs. And even today, there is children's work that goes on in the Bristol and Southwest area because of what George Mueller did. Our call is not just a call of faith on God to provide what we need in the everyday, but to provide what we need for ministry as well. The, the um, instructions Jesus was giving his disciples were instructions for a missionary trip. The story we just heard about George Muller was a story about him doing ministry and depending on God to provide for God's own work. So often we can feel, can't we, that we, we need to get the qualifications or we need to get all the money or we need to get all the things in place before we do anything. But if we can learn to trust Him to provide what we need from day to day, we can learn to trust Him to provide for His own work, the things He calls us to do. Now, I have a question for you. Are you a funnel or a sieve? It's a bit of a, a funny question. I've got a PowerPoint here. James, would you show us the pictures? Are you a funnel or a sieve? Okay. Let's see the first picture. Okay, look at that. A funnel collects so it can be stored, doesn't it? You see it's got a really big top to take in as much as possible to get it into a smaller container so it can be stored and put away. Let's see the next picture. A sieve collects so that it can be refined and distributed. It's got a big top to catch what's coming, but it's got a big bottom as well. So I'm not saying we all have to be Christians with big bottoms. <laughs> but, but it makes the point. One device is made to, to hoard, to collect, to store away. And one is made so that that thing can be given out more um, diversely, wider. Are you a funnel or a sieve when it comes to God's blessings? We can often take that funnel attitude, can't we? That I need to store up for myself. I need to put away for myself. What, what do we often hear people first? If we don't take care of home, how can we take care of others? Don't we? we? We hear that said all the time by people on the news and other things. When we talk about, as a country, trying to be generous and helping people who are struggling. We take a funnel attitude. We save up those blessings. But actually, the blessings we receive are merely supposed to... We're just supposed to be like the sieve, that conduit through which the blessings are distributed. They're given out and, and shaken out. We're the receptacle through which God chooses to bless other people in our lives. It's not there for our benefit. Sorry, I've lost my place now. Now, I want us to focus this year. I know, I know at the end of self-denial, we inevitably know we're all going to come up here and we're going to give money, okay? But I want us to try and think beyond money. 
Jesus, uh, these verses that Jesus gives us, they're not to do with money. They're about a way of life, aren't they? A way of living in reliance and dependence on Christ. If we start to look at these verses, Jesus talks about things um, that go beyond money. Things that money can't buy. He talks about healing. He talks about life. He talks about freedom from the enemy. Equally, there are also things that people would pay money for, wouldn't they? But Jesus advises, doesn't he, his disciples. What does he say to them? Don't bring silver or gold with you. All you need is a place to stay. I'll give you the rest. One of the the verses, if we go back a few um, verses before this, what we didn't see was Jesus, the Bible verse saying that Jesus gave them all authority to drive out demons, heal, and um, cure leprosy, raise people from the dead, and drive out demons. They are only able to do these miraculous things that people would pay the money for because God has given it to them in the first place. So Jesus says, don't worry about the money. All you need is your provision for for the day, a place to sleep, some food in your stomach. And Jesus does this because he wants his followers to contrast from followers of other. Because at the time, there were lots of people at the time traveling around the country where Jesus lived, proclaiming to offer them the secrets of the good life, the secrets of good living, the secret to eternal happiness. But all you had to do was to give a few simple pieces of silver and I'll let you in on the secret. I, I go on uh, Facebook a lot. Any of you on Facebook? Yeah? The advertisements seem to have overtaken Facebook, haven't they? And every so often, <coughs> I get taken in by one of those advertisements. And inevitably, they're one of the advertisements of learn my secrets of how to shed those pounds. It's inevitably always about losing weight. The secret way to lose weight without counting calories, without having to worry about what you're eating, you just have to do these three simple things and all those pounds will go away. And I read for half an hour, you know. I read through half an hour because they're like, before I tell you these three simple... And I read for like half an hour and inevitably I get to the bottom and it says, just pay me this amount of money, and I'll tell you the three secrets. I'm like, I've wasted a half hour of my life. But that's how the world works, isn't it? Jesus says, don't be like that. Give freely. You've received from me. You have the power to heal. You have the power to drive out the demons. You have the power to raise the dead, to preach my word. Give it freely because I gave it to you for free. Learn to trust me. And I suppose really that is the most important bit about these verses and the story of George Muller. It is that message about learning to live in dependence on God, not just for our daily lives, but for his own mission. The things he's called us to do. We've been thinking recently, haven't we, a little bit about the spiritual gifts. Our focus this year is on gift-based ministry as a church. Jesus might be sending out those 12, but his call to go out and to receive freely and give freely is to all of us. We all have a ministry Not all that ministry will require you to be here on a certain day during a certain time. Sometimes that ministry means that you're at your workplace, being that Christian influence. Sometimes it means um, standing outside your house on a sunny day and chatting to the lonely person who walks by. 
Ministry takes many forms. Rebecca and I and the disciples are not the only ones who've been called. We've all been called. But if we want to see those ministries blossom, if we want to see those things and miraculous things happen, we have to do so as we live in reliance on the provision of God for those ministries. We can't do them on our own, but we try to, don't we? The theologian Poole writes, our Savior designed to give them, he's talking about these Bible verses here, our Savior designed to give them an experience of the provision of God and to teach them to trust in Him. Trust in God's provision, not just for our basic needs, but for the ministry for which He's called us. Once we learn this, we, we truly understand. We, what do we sing at the beginning? Um, oh, what was our first song? It's totally... Guide me, oh that... Sorry, there's the other one, the other Welsh one. No, the other Welsh song. We didn't sing it today. But it says, when, my father, when, when I've reached the end of my hoarded resources, my father's full giving has only begun. Is that in Guide Me, O oh, Thy Great? No, it's in the other one, Bread of Heaven. Uh, Kumranda. Yes, that's it. That's it. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> but the point, the point is the same, that his resources far outweigh our own. So why do we always feel that we are the ones who have to make it happen? So often when we say we don't have enough money or I'm not qualified, so often those are excuses we use because we're afraid of failure. They stop us before we even try to start. But if God has called us to something, don't we believe that God will provide? Yes? Have, you all, have I made you all fall asleep? You're all very quiet today. Yes. Amen. 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 God will provide. If he's called you to, to minister to a particular person, he'll give you the patience to do it. If he's called you to, to start feeding somebody, even though you hardly have enough money to feed yourself, he'll make sure you have enough food to share with the other person. If he's called you to do an international ministry, which is going to reach millions around the world, he'll give you the people, the money, and the resources to do it. Because it's his mission, not ours. He just invites us to take part in what he's doing. To true generosity is giving to those who can't afford to pay you back. True friendship is befriending somebody who isn't in a position to give you a leg up in the world or any kind of advantage. True love is loving somebody without expecting anything in return. The only way to, to love like that, to befriend like that, to serve like that, is to rely on God to provide the things we need for life and for ministry. This morning... I want us, as I said, to look beyond the giving of money of self-denial and consider our personal giving of ourselves. God has not just called his disciples or George Muller or Rebecca or me. He's called all his people into ministry, into serving others, into freely giving as they freely receive. A ministry in your everyday life amongst the people you meet on the streets, in your homes, in the supermarkets, and at work. Each of us needs to respond to this call as part of our denying of ourselves and our proclaiming Christ. If God has called us, he will provide for us. 
we're going to have an opportunity to respond. And I, I believe Rebecca has some sand for us. I'll let her explain. We're going to um, enjoy another video of a, of a really old Salvation Army traditional song called When We Cannot See Our Way. And as we listen to this song, I want to invite you to come if you're able or to ask somebody to come and get a bag of sand. You know, sometimes we don't volunteer for the desert, but we find ourselves there anyway. And as we enter Lent in self-denial, this is a visible reminder of life in the desert. It's heavy. It could be a bag of money, but it isn't. It's a bag of sand. But we're going to take it in faith as we contemplate Jesus and his journey to the cross. We're going to carry our burdens. We're going to be reminded during this season. And then we're going to see what God is going to do with the desert experience at the end of the journey. So as we enjoy this song together, I want to invite you to come to collect your little piece of desert and to trust that the Lord will provide all that you need during the desert time.
In music, we sing sad songs in the minor key. But with the old songs, the rule is that you don't finish the song in the minor key, that you finish in the major key. They call it the resolution. That song is an example of when the resolution comes on the very last note. Sometimes the answers come right at the very end. But God will not finish our lives and our journeys on a sad note. Let's pray. Lord, as we enter this desert time, we're afraid of what the desert might hold for us and of the hardship ahead. But we remember that your Holy Spirit is not just with us, it is in us, making us soft and strong and giving us all we need for growth in the desert. And I pray that our faith will grow stronger as we put our trust in you, knowing that you will carry us through and the resolution will come, even if it comes right at the very end. Amen. Just a few quick announcements then before we have our final song. <clears throat> Just to say um, that our program is as, as normal. Uh, Heat Bank on Monday. Toddlers on Tuesday, over 60s on Thursday, and Food Bank on Friday. Um, one important announcement to keep in mind, on Sunday, I think it's either the 25th or 26th of February, um, I made a promise to you. Do you remember? A few weeks ago? Do you remember? Right at the end of my sermon, I promise I will do this if you'll do that. Do you, you don't remember. That's great. I love it when people remember what I say. I promised you I would do everything in my power to help you identify what your spiritual gift was if you promised you, when you found out what it was, you would do something with it. Okay? So on Sunday the 26th, here as part of our service, we will be carrying out for each person here um, some of you may be able to do it digitally, and I'll, I'll send, if you can do it digitally, that's fine. I'll get your email, and we can get you to fill it in online. But on that Sunday, for the many of you who perhaps don't use computers so much, we will be doing spiritual gift surveys with you as part of our, our, our worship together during that time. And uh, people from the leadership team uh, will come alongside you and help you with that. Unfortunately, I, I've looked at many different ones. Unfortunately, there are quite a few questions. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, by having the questions, it will help identify. And uh, what, what we'll do with that is we'll take, we're going to take everybody's findings. Not only will we help you understand your own, but we'll look at as church and we'll see where our gifts are spread out as a church. And, and how we can use those things. So please, please come. Make sure you're here on February 25th or 26th. I can't remember exactly what date is the Sunday, but uh, please do come along. And we'd encourage you to continue to pray for those who are unwell and those who are away at this time. One further announcement. There's a problem with the toilet. Okay, there's a problem with the toilet door. Several people have uh, had problems with it. So, escaping from the toilet. Okay, so there is a toilet at the back and there's two toilets in the community hall. Until we get it fixed, I would advise you not to use that one at the front. If, if you're not very strong. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to sing our final song, There Will Be Showers of Blessing. 
okay, which is number 314, and we'll stand and we'll sing this song together. end of the shower and now a benediction for you go in peace to love and to serve the Lord God bless you this day